Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Biz. And this week, we have a very special guest with us, Ed Huber from the Clorox Company. Hi, Ed. Good morning, good afternoon, I guess, in in Arkansas, Cindy. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Before we jump into the topic, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about Ed and also about the Clorox Company, and then we will jump right into all things ESG and what Clorox is doing in that space. So Ed is a uh, 30-year veteran to the CPG industry and has done an amazing amount of work there. And I'm fortunate now to be able to share with you that Ed is also a member of my external advisory board for the Integrity Leadership Initiative at Walton College. So he truly is a very special guest for us today. In his role um, at Clorox now, what Ed is responsible for is driving sustainable growth through innovation. And um, as we move from thinking about just disinfecting products in our in our homes, like the Clorox wipes, like these that I always have, <laughs> I have, I have a story about those. I'll share it in a minute. Uh, but as we come out of this COVID pandemic and think about extending uh, the disinfectants from our homes to right public health generally, Ed is now leading a brand new team um, that's thinking about how to extend uh, Clorox's disinfecting expertise into the area of public health. And we'll hear a little bit about that too. And his role as chief sustainability officer, he really is working on integrating Clorox's ESG um, strategy across across the portfolio of brands, not just the disinfecting wipes that I just showed you, um, but really so the, so that Clorox can grow its business in, in the right way, which I believe you call it Clorox good growth, which I like that. Yeah, that's, that's great. So Ed has had, like I said, a very storied career in C the CPG world, and he's done a number of um, different types of collaboration in the past and some sales and general management roles that you can tell us a little bit more about. But there are some real highlights to his career that show what a collaborative uh, person he is. And that would include things like reinventing the entire grilling category with Kingsford and Walmart and pairing Stephen Curry with Britta to promote healthy drinking habits. You might notice right behind Ed is a Stephen Curry jersey there. <laughs> and most recently, helping businesses welcome back customers safely and confidently during COVID because we are still in it a bit and then safely into the future when hopefully it's behind us. So it is really a pleasure to have you here today, Ed. And you have such an interesting story to share with the audience about a trip you made that I think you would uh, call a, a, a tipping point in, in your career and uh, kind of opened your eyes, if you will, to, to plastics and, and waste. And I'm hoping you might be able to share that story with our audience. Yeah, right. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity, Cindy. And, and I'm uh, humbled by your, your introduction. Uh, I, I I wish I'd actually done all of those things that you just said, um, but I was I was in the right place at the right time for, for many of those. Um, very fortunate to, to have an opportunity to work with Clorox and uh, certainly look forward to having an opportunity to work with with you and your, your talented board and, and kudos to, to you and your team for for driving you know, ethics firmly into business. Um, and it's a little bit kind of like my story of how I got into sustainability because I was a business person. Um, that had a had a kind of a, a brand that was very centered on the environment. Uh, I was running the Brita business, uh, as you'd mentioned. Um, you know, Stephen Curry was was our spokesperson. Brought a lot of notoriety to water, but one of the things that was really interesting about Brita, single Brita filter can remove the same or can provide the same amount of water as 700 single use plastic water bottles. Wow. So we had an, an environmental angle in the way that we marketed and presented uh, the Brita brand. Yeah. And uh, as a result of that, there was a group that was very uh, interested in coming up with end-to-end -end solutions for plastic waste. Mm -hmm. And they created what, what they referred to as an ocean plastic summit. And I was lucky enough to be invited. And so I show up on a ship that was actually that left Bermuda and went to the Atlantic gyre. And if you're not familiar with gyres, think about them as massive whirlpools in the center of uh, oceans that are far away from land, but they, they kind of create a little bit of a collecting pot for plastic. And so here we are in this, this beautiful setting, you know, clear blue water, no land as far as the eye can see. And all of a sudden an announcement came over the ship and they said, all right, we're going to stop here. 
we've got a massive patch of sargassum, which is basically floating seaweed out in the middle of nowhere. We're going to go explore it. And so we, we, we all got our scuba gear on. We jumped in and in the middle of nowhere, buried in this seaweed was everything from toothbrushes to toilet seats to bottled water, pens, caps. And it basically brought full circle the magnitude of the plastic problem that we had. That if, yeah. if in this area, in the middle of nowhere, plastic was was completely interfacing and oh by the way we had scientists on board they caught fish and shrimp from that area and when they dissected them there there was plastic in all of them um oh and, and so you could you could see firsthand right the the impact so anyway long story short uh humbling experience eyes wide open i came back and was a little fired up and i told our ceo that Boy, I am so proud that Clorox is stepping up and making a stand here. But you know what? You know, we are not doing nearly enough. And yeah. about two months later, <laughs> he approached me and said, <laughs> well, Ed, we're, we're actually ready to um, have our first chief sustainability officer in the company. And we want a business person to lead it. What do you think? And of course, you don't say no to the CEO. Right, right. <laughs> So fast forward here, here I am today, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, we're kind of two years into our journey and it's been a, a great learning experience um, and something that, that I'm, I'm proud to be part of. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, that, that truly was probably a life changing trip for you in terms of seeing it firsthand. And, and sometimes it is those kind of moments that, that can pivot a person's career in a way that, that really causes them to kind of go more forcefully in a certain direction. I think it's great though, your business background that you had, you know, previously, I think probably adds a tremendous amount of, of weight to what you're able to do in the ESG space, because you, you, you understand both sides essentially, and, and you're able to integrate it more specifically directly into the business strategy. Would you, would you say that's right? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I think it, at, at the end of the day, when you get a, you get an opportunity to be a, you know, be a business leader, be a general manager of a, of a business, you, you, you kind of create um, a little bit of, you get a little bit of a PhD in problem solving. So yeah. the thing that was super interesting about my experience on the boat is that there was, there was such a wide range of individuals. You had, um, you had chemical producers like Dow, you know, that, that, that make plastic. Uh, and then obviously you had people that use plastic in their packaging, like, like Clorox, but in between you had, you had NGOs, um, you had uh, environmental scientists, uh, and you had manufacturers, you had uh, waste management providers. And so when wow. you got a chance to see end to end, I think the, the business background in me kind of kicked in and said, okay, like we need to fix this. Mm -hmm. how, how do we break it down? And how do we, you know, how do we compartmentalize it so that we can take action? Because you and I have talked this, Cindy, is sustainability uh, is one of those things where it's not about the best ideas. It's about speed. And yeah. it's not about, wow, let me do something for my company or my brand. It's like, right. I need to do something for society. So the, right. the, the collaborativeness, the, the, the solution focus uh, is what I think I was able to bring. And I, I'm still trying to do that today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's awesome. And in fact, Clorox just made some, some news um, recently. The announcement just came out that you were uh, an activator for the U.S. plastic uh, packs, which is the, kind of a U.S. strategy for how do we get to a circular uh, plastics um, uh, environment by 2025. And, you know, that's only, that's only three years away. And so that's, that's kind of big news. I think it's really, really important for Clorox, given that there's a lot of plastics in the CBG products. But can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I'm sure there's a ton of collaboration going on for that yeah. national pack. I mean, you, you, the, you know, the, the word collaboration can't be emphasized enough. And I think that the essence of, of the plastic problems, which I think everyone understands how, how acute it is. And as evidenced by what I, I experienced on the boat, you know, that, that, that plastic, and when you actually got to see the products, they even though I was in the Atlantic gyre, they were originating from the United States. So yeah. the, the, the plastic was traveling um, and, and it was getting into rivers, which then eventually got into the ocean. So the seriousness of the plastic and the fact that plastic just simply will not degrade on its own. And, you know, you, you make plastic with some, some crazy stat I heard, 90% of all the plastic ever produced is still on the planet somewhere. So 
kind of the U.S. plastics pack in a collaboration is there's not a silver bullet, right? So we know that as manufacturers, particularly um, consumer goods manufacturers, by our very nature, right, we, we make right. stuff that's disposable. Right. Um, we've got to reduce the packaging that we use, right? Um, we have to encourage recyclability. And, you know, but at the end of the day, if, if it's all about recycling, then that's going to be insufficient because the infrastructure could not handle it. In fact, right. go back to my, my plastic. The reason I got so fired up about single use plastic bottles is that depending on the number you see, only eight to 10 percent of the of the bottles actually make it all the way through the recycling system. So recycling is a great, great thing and we need to do more of it. But we also need to reduce our usage of the product. So right. the US plastic pack brings people together, looks at it more end to end, and then we can activate against a total system solution, uh -huh. um, which to my earlier comment, you know, we just need to go faster in everything we're doing in this space. Yeah. And I think compostable too was one of the, the aspects of the, the plastic pack. So recyclable, use less of it, but also make it so that it does degrade, right? Well, I mean, it's, you know, do not underestimate the power that innovation can play in there, right? Because I think that as we uh, get creative about um, innovative new solutions that um, either don't use plastic at all, or that if you're using it, you use it in such a way that it can be, um, you know, easily composted or it can, where it can, can disintegrate. So the whole, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle uh, moniker is, is very much kind of at the, at the core of what we're trying to do. Yeah. That's really interesting. So let's talk about um, at the core of what you're trying to do. And, and let's talk about uh, Clorox's, I think you call it the Ignite strategy, which I, when I read about it a little bit online, I really loved the way it was framed up, which is it's, it's the integration again of kind of you as a human being, but in the Clorox strategy as well, because it's integrating the business metrics for Clorox strategy with the ESG metrics um, and making it one comprehensive uh, Ignite strategy overall um, that I think has four main prongs to it, right? It's like people, plastics, products, and, and, and governance that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, with plastics kind of fitting right into the, the, the planet part of it, I would guess, right? The right. planet part of right. that strategy? Right. Okay. <laughs> so there's got to be a tremendous amount of uh, action behind the scenes to bring that strategy to life and a lot of collaboration. Could you give us maybe some specific examples of, of how does that actually work? How do you how do you do that at Clorox? What does a collaboration behind the scenes look like so you can achieve those goals? You know, I, I think you know one of the one of the things that you're going to hear a consistent theme, and, and you you've said it. Um, if it's not collaboration, it's embedding into our business practices. Yeah. And so, one of the things that that we tried to do, uh, and one of the reasons why um, they they wanted a business person in the sustainability role, is that we want to make sustainability not something that we do, but kind of part of who we are. And, and part of who we are is that we, we, we develop, we manufacture, uh, we, we, we ship, we use um, products. And so at, you know, as a marketer, as a manufacturer, it needs to kind of be embedded into all the different aspects uh, that we do. Um, so a big part of our Ignite strategy is, is centered on, on innovation. And as you start innovating forward, I think, um, consumers, you and I were talking about this at the beginning. I think um, the consumers of tomorrow are not going to give you a, a, a pass that if you create a great product experience, but it has a negative impact on the environment, it's not going to be acceptable. So your ability to take those insights and fully integrate them into businesses. So yeah. at, at Clorox, we've got a very broad portfolio. Everybody knows our wipes, which I appreciate you being a, a, a user. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Um, but we, we have a very disparate uh, portfolio that not everyone would think about. We have everything from, you know, Burt's Bees, right? Uh, which, you know, are iconic uh, lip balms from Burt's right. Bees. Uh, you mentioned, you know, I'd, I'd worked on Kingsford Charcoal. We have Glad Trash Bags, uh, Fresh Step Cat Litter, Hidden Valley Ranch, and obviously all the, the, the Clorox products. We think that every single one of those businesses some of which don't feel very environmentally friendly, things like Glad. I mean, they're, they're plastic bags. Right. We have to improve 
every single brand. We have to move the needle. We can't just say, well, we're doing some great things with, you know, Brita and Birch Bees, which kind of makes sense. Yeah. We have to take charge of every single part of our portfolio. And again, that's where kind of the business integration comes in. Uh Yeah. Um, Because you can read tons of stories, you know, sustainability is good business. In in theory, uh, you're going to use less raw materials so you could save cost and then you could invest, leverage that savings to invest it back in things like innovation and create, you know, kind of a virtuous cycle. So long-winded way of saying integrate innovation with sustainability at the core of what we do. And I would imagine packaging is also a big a big part of that and and that might be a good place that where you could highlight like what does a how does the packaging process all come together and, and like who are the different players in that process and so part of activating your your ignite strategy i imagine is influencing others further upstream right um who help kind of put all the so how does that how does that work like what does that look like how do you help them how do they help you uh reach your ignite strategy goals yeah that i that's a that's a great example to run water through the pipe cindy i think you know one of our stated goals in ignite is that we're going to reduce our virgin uh packaging material both fiber and plastic by 50 percent by um by 2030 And to do that, you have to take an end to end. We have to work with our suppliers um, that give us the raw materials. We have to work with our product developers actually to say, do I really need that packaging? Is it Mm -hmm. that important? Can Mm -hmm. I communicate the benefit in some other way other than like a big billboard? Have to work with um, retail partners down the road from you, like at Walmart and say, how can we how can we transfer those learnings all the way to the shelf? Yeah, yeah. You know, so we spend a lot of time collaborating with Walmart on things like, um, you know, what if you transformed an entire category? You might be able to get rid of the packaging, not just for one of my brands, but for an entire category. So use yeah. that as an example. That's an end to end type uh, process. Yeah, that it would be great just to do one aspect of it, but think about the power and the impact if you kind of brought. Um, you know, the, the experience of the consumer using the product right. at home to when they buy it at a Walmart store to when they make it in our factories to when we get the raw materials from our suppliers. You really have to think that broad to find opportunities uh, to save and, and be more efficient with uh, valuable raw materials. Yeah. And and then it doesn't even end with a retailer. I mean, because you guys are consumer good products companies, right? It goes all the way to the end user. And then what do they do with it afterwards? And right. so that probably gets into, I would imagine, like life cycle assessments in some way, like life cycle of a product and, and what happens. How does that help inform your strategy, um, life cycle assessments? And how do those kind of fit in, like truly end to end? Yeah, yeah. So um so two thoughts. One, you know, you brought up the good point. You want to finish it with the with the consumer, right? Ultimately, as a as a as a marketer of consumer products, we're we're trying to serve you, right? We're trying to yeah. make your life better with the products that we give. Um, and you'll hear a lot of terms uh, in the environmental space around circularity. Yep. So what what circularity means is you basically can close the loop from the time that you you make the product to the till its end of life. And if you can make it circular so that it doesn't end up having a footprint in the environment. So you'll see things show up. Like, for example, we worked at, with a company called Loop um, so that you basically would have a, a refillable canister of wipes that, that never has a need for external packaging. And then there's just a process whereby you just, you just would buy the refill. Um, so there's lots of activity like that. But where those ideas come from, and this is the second part of your question, and you mentioned life cycle analysis, and I've found it fascinating. So what, what we do is we use an external uh, party so that they can be appropriately critical. And they basically track. Um, it's kind of like if you could staple yourself to a trash bag and you, you look at the process for the entire life cycle, you find where you, the greatest impact of your particular product actually lives. So I, I use trash bags as an example because I was working on the Glad business at the time. And I think everybody, Uh wow, the the biggest impact of trash bags is, you know, these plastic bags in the landfill. And yes, that is part of our life cycle. But actually, on the stuff that you can't recycle today, 
yeah. having a good quality product that once it does go to the landfill, it stays there, there uh -huh. there's a benefit. But what, what we found when we looked at the total life cycle is that almost half of the impact that, uh, that goes into the making of a trash bag is, goes on in the conversion of oil into resin, which happens at our suppliers. So we have to reach deeper into our suppliers and say, hey, what can you do before we even take possession of the raw material to lower the footprint? So it's those kinds of ideas that come from life cycle analysis that as, as a business owner, I can say, okay, do I have a, do I have a consumer problem? Because I'm going to have to change it dramatically and the consumer is going to have to get used to it. Do I have a, a form problem? Is there a way to do that where the, the form of the product is much easier to use? Uh, or is it a raw material, which is like, you know what, I just need to change the, 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 the chemistry of what I'm doing on the front end. Uh, mm -hmm. It at least gives me, <laughs> it gives me some guidance as to where I put resources to come up with unique solutions. Oh, yeah. And it really changes the view of, of, of life cycle of the product, right? I mean, you, you may think life cycle is like following it all the way through to its very end, but it also is very important as to where you begin, as you just pointed out, right? And going all the way back to like thinking about where do the raw materials actually come from and how can you reduce that? So, so let, let, let's talk about the goals and then the question that everybody always comes back to, which is super important, is how do you actually measure it? You're right. And how do you make sure that the measurement is accurate and transparent um, and reliable, right? So that so that so the end consumer and anybody else who wants to know the business managers are trying to manage anybody, right, can really assess: Are we hitting the mark? Right. It's fine to do things, but. But if it's not hitting the mark, then you kind of have to rejigger, as, as we all know. Right, right. So, so there are a number of different rating agencies out there now. You know, you've got SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. You've got the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, just to name a few. And um, it, it's clear that Clorox has been applying uh, many of those standards to, to be able to report on what the progress is. But what kind of insights have you all gotten on your strategy from applying all of those standards? Um, and, and how have you, if at all, rejiggered your strategy in light of that? Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting when you say, you know, rejiggered our strategy. In fact, um, our sustainability aspirations, um, I think, were forever influenced by a lot of this work. And I think a lot of the, 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 the agencies that you talked about, the word that I think is important um, or the words that are important are consistency and transparency. Yeah. Because um, everything I think you've heard me say is that it's end to end. And, um, you know, we're in a race against time here. So if I just do my part and I clean up my operations, but I don't impact the broader um, problem, then what, what good have we done? It's better than doing nothing. Don't get me wrong. Right, um, but... But I think this, you know, this foundational element, um, we actually embedded it into our, our company purpose, right? So our, our, our company purpose is, you know, we champion people to be well and thrive every single day. And so to do that, for people to thrive, right? You have to have, you know, healthy lives, a clean world and thriving communities. You, you cannot do that without an overt focus um, on these areas. And I think the... The, the you know the the all the governing bodies even even when I made our our um, uh, the comments about climate change you know it's it's good to know what game you're playing business people are motivated by metrics and are motivated by results right and so if we baseline our current carbon footprint with a detailed amount of data all the way down to the raw material component. And then you can start tracking it over time. You can show the progress and lots of companies, Clorox among them, you know, then makes external commitments. Mm -hmm. that, that not only holds us accountable to our commitments, which is certainly a part of it, but I think the big part of this, Cindy, that, that becomes interesting with, with this kind of energy is it, it showcases the, the, the industry level of collaboration. So that if there is something that one of my competitors in Europe uses that transparency, I should be able to apply that to my business. Or if I crack the code on something that I've unlocked and you know I'm, I'm the biggest player in most of my categories in the US, I should be able to kind of share that for the greater good. 
So I think it, it just creates this transparency that enables um, collaboration and focus on the goals that, that matter most. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there seem to be so many different standard kind of measurement bodies out there though, that I, and some of them are consistent in some ways, but different in other ways. And the scales they use to measure are somewhat different. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are on um, bringing, you know, a regulatory body like the SEC for, for us based public companies into the uh, kind of into the picture, whether or not you think that would be helpful or hurtful or, or, or what are your thoughts on, on some type of, you know, consistent and transparent standard that essentially all public companies essentially would be, would be held to? Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, you know, would always be in favor of, you know, what I'd refer to as, you know, very clear disclosure. Guide. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, don't leave that up to the, to the individual so that you can, they can be implemented consistently across Industry. There you go. Right. Um, you know, because we're all part of the of the same solution. Right. Um, and I, I think that if, you know, if industry A has a different, you know, um, disclosure guidance than industry B, that's where it gets a little complicated. It, uh, it gets confusing. Yeah. Um, but if we if we do our jobs right, um, you know, I would tell you that we 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 use the external agencies as a as a guidance tool. But uh, if we're going to be leaders, we also have to be pushing the envelope about you know creative new solutions, mm -hmm. um, regardless of you know what an external agency would want us to do. We have to. Yeah. Clorox has a has a has a founding thing in our in our values around do the right thing. Um, it's probably why you couldn't find disinfecting wipes, Cindy, during the pandemic, like so many people. Because one of our one of our do the right thing principles is that you know we're going to prioritize healthcare. But I do think that there is there's so many different standard setting kind of bodies out there that while they are good guidance tools, um, sustainability reports have in many respects I think sometimes been seen by um, the investors or the or the public reading them as uh, sort of marketing tools or you know it's it's the corporate affairs angle. Um, but I, I sense a real shift in that into what you described as it's it's part of the purpose of the Clorox company. Uh, it's not just what you do, it's who you are and how you do it. And so bringing some kind of consistency and transparency to the reporting process might be something that's really welcomed, I think, for everyone to make sure that, you know, people can be more sure that what they're not, that what they're not reading greenwashing, to use that term, um, right. you know, kind of kind of loosely, but that that there actually is some teeth behind it in terms of uh, 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 regulatory um, oversight. Um, so that might bring some, some needed transparency to it, let's say. I couldn't agree more. So I have to just ask you, let's just stop, step back. We've been talking about uh, Clorox's role in this whole ESG space. And um, if you step back and think about it, you know, over time, Ed, it, it really does feel to me like, ESG has moved from sort of a side a sideline topic over here to something that is very front and center. Um, kind of the same way I'd say that that we now think about uh, the purpose of a corporation a little differently. It isn't just mm -hmm. to you know serve the shareholders; it's to serve all of the stakeholders. And and that kind of to me fits right in with this idea of ESG being front and center. Um, but I want to ask you: Do you think it is here to stay? Or do you think this is just a moment? Oh, it, it's um, it's absolutely here to stay. And I, I think that the single biggest reason I think you were alluding to it is um, there is there is pull from every aspect of business. So there is certainly pull from consumers, and I think particularly younger consumers who um, care a lot about their impact on society. Um, so you've seen th that demand increase. You, you brought up uh, investors. Um, so there's things every single day where, where um, public companies like Clorox and others, I mean, you know, the investment community is demanding transparency and standards um, uh, to continue to, to treat you favorably from an investment standpoint. I think from, a, um, from an attraction of talent, uh, from a recruiting and a retention standpoint, I think having a strong set of values is going to be a beacon to get someone to choose to work for company A versus company B. So the pull, I think, is so universal that this is absolutely here to stay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there was a particular tipping point or do you think this is just sort of we've arrived here on the journey? Does it feel like there was a catalyst moment, sort of like your 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 trip when you you went and saw all the plastics in the ocean? Yeah, that was my my personal tipping point. But but here is what I what I think is is interesting or troubling about um, the challenge that we have is that unlike so many other things that that rally us, like like the pandemic as, as an example, right? Um, when it comes to to climate change and environmental, there, there's no there, there's no tipping point. Yeah. We've seen a very slow, gradual impact, and it it, it didn't happen overnight. Um, and in fact, you know, when you when you talk about when I talk to people in the scientific community, you know, they're, they're measuring global warming, um, you know, in the, the fractions of degrees. But when yeah. you when you do that over time, so it's kind of like you even saw it a little bit during the pandemic, right? Things would things would kind of shift mm-hmm. and then go right back to normal. So the challenge I think that we have is that there's not a tipping point. Now, I say that, um, you know, when while we're, we're taping this you know, the, the West is having, you know, record heat uh, that they've never seen before. I've got friends in Seattle that, that have yeah. never seen uh, triple digits and they've had it now for three days straight. So there's definitely um, things on the climate side that are capturing people's attention. Yeah. But the root cause of that was not a single event. Yeah. It, it was just a series of activities over many, 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 many years. So mm-hmm. um, I, I love I love the point and I'd love to have a good answer for the tipping point. But I think the answer is there's not one which creates a very unique challenge to make sure that this gets elevated. I'll give you, I'll give you one other anecdote that, that I thought was, was fascinating. So the same group on the, the ocean plastics um, boat that, that I went on, they kept, kept track of that. And obviously we were very aware of trying to lower the amount of plastic that was getting into the environment. Right pandemic hits, we all know about uh, the impact that that had on healthcare workers and, and, you know, PPE. And within a matter of months, despite all of the efforts to lower it, there were enough um, face masks put into the environment after, I think it was two or three months that you could cover the entire country of Switzerland. Oh, wow. The the masks that had been used, discarded and made their way into the environment. Mm -hmm. So, it's a it's a it's a cautionary tale that we have to we have to keep this front and center. Um, which to your first question, that's why I think it's here to say because I think now you've got pull yeah. from so many different areas that if if one area gets gets you know deprioritized a bit, the other areas will keep it relevant. Yeah. Well, Ed, this has been a fabulous conversation, and and thanks for all the work that you are doing there at Clorox to to help uh, in the area of plastics and beyond. And thank you for being a member of the advisory board for the Integrity Leadership Initiative. But I always like to end these podcasts and videos with um, just a quick question in case someone wants to go deeper. I love to know, do you have any good recommendations on books or I don't know, whether podcasts or a documentary perhaps, or a short movie, something that would be helpful to the audience if they wanted to learn a little bit more about this area. Yeah. You know, um, you know, there's no shortage of material. I, I think that, you know, one that's easy to remember, there was a, um, a Netflix documentary called the plastic ocean. So I think that that was one that kind of kicked off a lot of the awareness, um, you know, and it captured visually for a lot of folks, the impact. I think you, you, we all remember the, you know, the turtle with the plastic straw. And it was amazing how quickly plastic straws got banned in the U.S. So, it is, I know. Right. So if you haven't seen the plastic ocean, um, I, that's an oldie but a goodie. Okay. Um, a group that we've been working with called Futera, their founder, um, Solitaire Townsend is her name. She wrote right. a book called The Happy Hero. And it's a quick read. Uh, you know, cheap to, to download, right? So you can be sensitive to, to the environment. Yep. Um, and what, what Sally did in that book is, is it, it uh, basically used climate change as a, if you think of the biggest, baddest, hardest challenge to overcome, and can, it, can an individual really make a difference? She actually kind of gives you a little guide to like, yes, you can. Yeah. So the happy hero, um, I would encourage that. And for those of you that just want the quick, click and read and, and want to just go into YouTube. Um, there is a, an artist that we used at Clorox. His name's Prince EA. So if you go into YouTube and you search Prince EA, there's a piece he did called three seconds. 
And basically he dimensionalizes the impact that we have had on the environment in such a short amount of time. So it creates a very compelling case for change. But I think that the thing in all of these is that you have to balance the fact that, wow, this is an urgent situation, but we can undo it. We can turn the tide on climate change. Um, we're going to have to do things different. We're yeah. going to have to make some different trade-off choices, but it's not like this is completely out of our control. So it's daunting. It's troubling. Um, but do any one, any one of those three. So whether you're Netflix, YouTube, or you just like to read, I think those are a couple of my Yeah. Favorites. And that YouTube one, that's awesome. I have to recommend that one as well. I mean, it's only three minutes long. We'll drop the link to it in the oh, show good, notes good. so everyone can find it yep. uh, and make that easy. But wow. Yeah, that was, that was, it's, it's, it's quite compelling. Uh, but I do think the challenge, like you just mentioned, is taking this massive issue and personalizing it so that individuals actually do feel like they can do something about it. So the, the Happy Hero book sounds like that's exactly what that she's doing in that book. So that that sounds like a great one too. Yeah, well, thank you, Ed. The, this has been fabulous. Thank you so, so much for being a, a guest today and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. And I, I hope the next time I, I see you, it's on campus uh, and not via Zoom. But thank you so much for the time today, Cindy. I do too. Thanks, Ed. Bye-bye.